Hi everybody, thanks for joining us on our YouTube channel and I have a very interesting uh, guest here uh, on our segment. Uh, his name is Mr. Keith Dicker of Ice Cap Asset Management. Um, he, wrote, he writes these uh, very in-depth global market outlooks uh, that come out every uh, couple months and I strongly encourage you to uh, visit his website as well as read over the, these outlooks as they encompass a whole variety of issues uh, that are not normally discussed that need to be discussed and uh, provides a great analysis on those particular spectrums. Uh, Keith, thanks for joining us and just, just, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and the firm IceCap Asset Management. Okay, uh, thanks Tony, thanks for having us here today. Uh, so IceCap Asset Management, I, I launched the company about five years ago. The main idea for launching IceCap was that prior to coming back to Canada, I was in Bermuda offshore for 10 years. Yeah, so I was part of a team, and so we, we manage multi-currency, multi-strategy portfolios. So uh, our clients have a combination of you know, cash, currency strategies, as well as fixed, um, fixed income, equity, commodities, as well as hedge fund strategies. But being offshore for so many years, it, it really gave me a different perspective on, first of all, how the really wealthy people in the world, how they manage the money. And, and the main difference between those investors and everyone else is that the really wealthy people in the world, they avoid losses. Mm -hmm. so they're quite content with their, you know, you picture their chart lines just moving up gradually all the time. They want absolute returns with very low volatility. Uh, but if you compare that though to, you know, most investors in the world, most investors, you know, they're always reaching for returns. So let's jump right into it. I mean, you, you write these global market outlooks. Your last one was in July in a world of chaos or harmony and how do you invest in a world like that? Uh, the spectrums that I wanted to discuss with you, political, the economic spectrum, social, financial, and then how do we go forward in turning this financial chaos into harmony? So let's start off with political. Uh, what are your views on Brexit and are there additional European Union stability concerns that we, we should be looking at? Yeah, well, first of all, we absolutely need to be concerned about the EU and especially the Eurozone, though it, it's not going to survive. So we'll talk a bit about that. So, you know, obviously the Brexit vote is over. Um, you know, mainstream media got it wrong, the polls got it wrong. And uh, personally, you know, I'm not British, so I was not voting, but it, it, was, it was the best move for Britain to opt out of the EU. And, you know, what was very interesting is that, you know, all, all of the run-up to that vote and the referendum, you know, it was all focused on what would happen if it left. It was going to be really bad, you know, and, and they kept taking the perspective that the EU was great, you know, it will continue on in this linear growth format and, and so forth. Whereas, you know, the reason I'm, I'm supportive of the Brexit vote is that it's the opposite view. That the EU is not holding together. The Eurozone especially is not going to hold together. Mm -hmm. So for Britain voting to leave, you know, because they're basically, you know, they're getting the ride off the Titanic. You know, they, they get a free ticket. Mm -hmm. Whereas they stayed, it would, would have been a lot worse for them. So uh, you know, that is quite, you know, quite good for them. As for referendums uh, elsewhere in the EU, oh boy, it, you know, it's all going to be polit politically driven. Of course, uh, you have Italy coming up shortly. Uh, Portugal has, has their problems. As does Spain. The French have a huge election next year. Same with Germany, and. Uh, you know, it, it's really going to be politically driven what will drive the EU as well as the Eurozone apart. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the when we look at these different countries and what's happening, the first thing we always do, we, you know, we always check our heart at the door. You know, it, it's irrelevant what I think should happen. You really have to sit back and say, okay, this is happening. How are people going to react to it? The bottom line is, it doesn't matter if you're looking at you know, the U.S or a lot of the, the European countries, there are a lot of unhappy people in the world. And when you look at that politically, you know, they're, they're very much against the established political parties. So that, that's what we see happening, and it, there is going to be some more uh, surprise election outcomes coming up. 
And and uh, taking a step back, do you expect more referendums then in the in the eurozone? I mean, well, <clears throat> you know, Britain was was different because you know the referendum was, was politically it was caused from you know from the last British election. You know, Cameron and the Conservatives, you know, they were very low in the polls. And they said, you know what? Yeah, if we win the election, we'll have a referendum on the EU. Mm -hmm. That helped them you know, get their surprise victory. Of course, then you had to have the referendum. <laughs> it didn't work out for them in the end. Right. If you look at Italy, for example, this fall, you know, the, the same thing. So Renzi, he's having a referendum, not on the EU, but it will be indirectly on the EU. Uh, he wants to change the political structure of the Italian Senate. And, you know, whereas that is the agenda of that referendum, it, it will be turned around that it's really a vote out of four or against the EU. So uh, it, it, it's happening. It, it's coming down the road. And, um, you know, regardless if it's, you know, 51% for, you know, 49 against or, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. In almost every country these days, you know, half the people are not happy with the other half. So it, that, that creates, you know, very big changes. Interesting. And, and just to go follow up on your comments on the U.S. election, so how does this play into the world of investing up to the election? How does that affect worldwide currencies and precious metals prices? You know, the American elections will probably be the most entertaining uh, election we have in quite some time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and, it, and again, you know, re removing, you know, stepping aside from why I, would, I think personally, you know, who's good and bad and what we're going for and so forth. Um, uh, Trump is going to get an awful lot of votes, and uh, it, you know it, it really is its establishment, you know, which is represented by Clinton, you know, against you know the anti-establishment mm -hmm. Trump. So when you look around the world, you know, mainstream media, you know, they're very anti-Trump. So it's it's getting a lot of you know a lot of airtime everywhere. I mean, we're talking about it, of course. But, you know, quite honestly, Sonny, it, it's really irrelevant whether Clinton or Trump wins the election mm -hmm. for the Americans. Um, actually feel bad for whoever, whoever does win it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, they're not going to be able to turn around what, what's, what's happening. And, you, know, we, um, you know, we are very big U.S. dollar bulls. Mm -hmm. Right, this does hit financial markets and the bond market. Uh, we fully expect a lot of foreign money seek safety. As I mentioned earlier, that's what individuals do. They run away from losses. Mm -hmm. and, and the U.S. dollar market is the only one big enough in the world to absorb this capital. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the short term, we're, we're expecting a U.S. dollar correction. So, you know, we, we are positioning our portfolios for that. And as for precious metals, there's two things. We really expect precious metals, and, you know, really we're talking about gold mostly. They're going to do extremely well. Gold is going to go up considerably. So let's round out the political spectrum then with um, touching on Turkey and Russia relations of late, as well as you know the the South China Sea dispute between China, the U.S., and a couple of other Asian countries. Um, you know, with respect to Japan as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on those two uh, issues there? I think you know they're taking a backseat to what's happening politically. Um, you know, the, the tensions have always been there. China and, and Japan, but that's not going to change. And you know the whole, you know, Russian Western world crisis. You know that's that's continuing as well. Uh, Turkey, you know, they're they're likely pivoting towards Russia. But, you know, but they're sitting there. They're, you know, they're they're effectively bribing the EU. You know, for uh, for different monies as well. You know, help out with the migrant crisis. So, but again, it's an example where, you know, there, there is chaos all around the world, it, it's happening. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, all of this will come to a head in, in our view. It, it won't be because of Russia or, or Turkey or, or China, Japan. Uh, it, it's really in Europe and specifically, well, the, the political move that will ignite it or just simply the banks just running into problems. So let's let's move on now and switch gears and talk about the economic spectrum. You know your your market outlook has mentioned you know very some very interesting facts. Uh, one of them being you know worldwide GDP. Uh, you mentioned that it's slowing dramatically um, around the world across continents. 
what are the implications um, from that uh, and where should investors look at in, in emerging markets? And you're also seeing the U.S., you know, everybody's looking as the U.S. as the main indicator of U.S. growth numbers slowing as well. But the labor numbers of recent have, have been relatively good. So is there something that we're missing or how do we gauge this? Yeah, it's pretty chaotic in other words. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you know, and again, to give everyone an idea how a, you know, a professional manager thinks, the, the one thing that's been wrong in the industry for so long is that it's a mistake to link economic growth to financial markets. That that's not going to be the key driver of markets. Rates are the key driver and inflation and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. But so we are expecting global growth to continue to, to grind tighter and, and tighter. And even though we see that happening, uh, we, we expect equity markets to do quite well. And, and again, the reason for that is money, foreign investors will be shifting into dollars as well as equities. In other words, they'll be shifting out of the bond market. Mm-hmm. Out of the, the main thing when you look at from a growth perspective is to understand how central banks are harassed. But when they get together, you know, they don't really talk about GDP. They, they instead they talk about the velocity of money. Mm-hmm, right. Velocity of money is just another way to measure GDP. So GDP measures you know, how much money is being spent in the economy. Um, another mathematical way to measure it is how much money has been put into the economy and how fast is it swishing around. Mm-hmm. You know, I buy a car and then you know, the dealership, they take that money, they buy something else and, and so forth. And you get the velocity of money moving faster. And when things are slowing down, you know, the velocity of money will slow. And what the central banks have always you know, believed is that when they provide stimulus to the economy by you know, cutting rates or you get fiscal stimulus with you know, change to the tax rates or you know, fiscal spending, or even worse still, what we're getting on the last seven years, we're getting you know, money printing through quantitative easing. You know, these, these are very aggressive monetary stimulus policies that they're putting in there. And that should cause the velocity of money to go up, mm-hmm. which would cause you know, GDP to go up. But what's, what's happening though around the world is that velocity of money is it's slowing. So despite all this dynamism that's coming online, um, private investors, you know, we're, we're still not spending money. Mm-hmm. And that, that's what has everyone, you know, quite confused. Um, you know, earnings number, that gets influenced with the stock buybacks and, and so forth. But, but again, when we look at growth around the world, it, it's, we like to use the word grinding, it, it's grinding tighter. So China, for example, going from 10 to 6%, that's 6% growth is great, you know, you know, the Western world will take it, but that's a dramatic slowdown for mm-hmm. China. And uh, when you look where else China is, you know, they're, they're headed like, you know, the 2, 3, 1% growth area as well. So it's going to be real tough for these guys. So from an economic perspective, that's going to result in two things. Uh, Central banks will continue to be very easy with their policies. So overnight rates will stay very low. Uh, They'll go negative if they can. And they'll either continue or or start QE programs. And uh, so that is causing investors to do funny things. You mentioned emerging markets. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we haven't talked about negative rates yet, but it's, <laughs> it's probably the worst idea that I've ever seen in, in, you know, in, in the economic and financial world. But because rates, those negative rates, you know, there's such a large amount of, of bonds now with, with negative yielding rates on them, it's forcing investors to seek return elsewhere. And in the fixed income world, the only way to do that is to what, what we would call move out into credit. So they're, they're buying high yield and emerging markets. Mm-hmm. And um, they're going to get their, uh, their head handed to them for doing that. So mm-hmm. that, that, that's two parts of the market we're, we're avoiding, but like, play. And um, you know, investors should, should consider that. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, you mentioned a great, a great interesting point of negative yields, which we'll talk about in more detail as you have some excellent charts that, that we'll, uh, we'll put up on the segment here. Uh, but before that, let's talk about bonds then. Can you talk about the growth of bonds? Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, in your outlooks that there is a bubble coming. 
um, you know, and uh, but the interesting thing though is that whenever there's a bond issue, it does get swallowed up by investors. Um, and uh, you know, I'll put up a couple of charts here. One of your charts that you had in your April outlook was your negative yield absurdity, uh, of which Japan is in the lead of you know um, just issuing just outrageous uh, um, amount of a uh, of. of of, of funds uh, via bonds. Can you just comment on, on that, on on a few of the issues that we're facing in, in the bond market? Yeah, sure. I mean, with the whole idea, the whole concept of, of negative rates is that central banks, they want to force people who are hoarding money in their bank account to spend it. So, mm -hmm. you know, people getting a zero uh, rate on their cash in the bank, you know, you said, okay, we'll take zero, that's fine. Soon as you start having to uh, pay a rate, you know, for the bank to hold your money, you know, the central banks are thinking you're, you're going to take it out and you're going to spend it. So that that's you know the, the rationale behind this. But what what's happening is that as you get more and more rates going to zero and then going to negative, um, it's completely wiping out all the income that was being generated, all the low risk, no risk income that's being generated around the world. So the low risk investor, you know, a few years back, we're getting four, five, six percent you know, in their bank account and return deposit or GIC or whatever. And, and they're, they're spending that money. You know, they're going out, that's what they're living on. But that's enough completely wiped out. So if you think about it from a growth perspective, how can people spend money if they're not generating, you know, that low risk or risk free, you know, interest that they're getting? So that, that's one part of monetary policy that the central banks are, are getting it wrong. Uh, the, the other one is what people understand is, is how the bond market is, is working is that there's two components really. One, you have the quantitative easing. So uh, we just call it money printing. I mean, they're, they're effectively printing money, but they're using it to buy bonds that are already up on the market. So what that does is that it drives interest rates lower. And again, central banks are thinking that if you have low interest rates, people and companies will borrow money and then they'll spend it. Um, but as we mentioned a few a few moments ago, you know that's not happening. You know the bulk of borrowing that's taking place is for financial engineering reasons. So companies are using it for stock buyback and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you know because the velocity of money continues to go down, it just you know it demonstrates that it's not working. You know in, in the institutional uh, investment world, you know, fixed income guys, they're they're mandated to, to stay in, in you know in, in the market. So, um, you know, I, I have friends who manage European, you know, fixed income, and, you know, they're buying this negative yielding German debt, Swiss debt, you know, you, you name it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have to do it. And, um, but the smart private investor who does not have to buy this stuff, they're not doing it. Mm -hmm. um, they're not buying high yield debt or emerging market debt. Anyone who's buying, by the way, anyone who's, who is investing in that today, they're not. In, they're being sold that. So you know, their broker or advisors calling them up and say, "Yeah, you, know, you can buy this fund. It's yielding five or six percent." You know, in the story behind it. Um, you know, if it was really explained to investors what what is in that basket, that they wouldn't be investing in it. So uh, again, it's just another problem that we have in, in the industry. But negative rates. Um, you know, we're actually quite happy to see it come along because. Was is telling us that you know we're almost at the end of the uh, the bull market in fixed income, and uh, the end means that rates when they bottom out and they start uh, lashing off to really quickly on the long end. So even because yeah, I know you mentioned in your July outlook. Uh, you have a very interesting chart, actually, two charts, which I'll put up here as well for our viewers to see. And one is showing the, you know, indicating that we have had the lowest yields in the last 32 years, but also the lowest yields in over 700 years. So given that you think that we are at the complete bottom and yields will start to come up in the next few years, is that is that what you're saying? Actually, I think growth or someone else came up recently with one of the longer than that. Right. Uh, yeah, so um, the way equity markets move, that if they move in these big secular cycles, and it's not a regular business cycle, like three to five years, they can move in a cycle that can last anywhere from, you know, six up to 16, 20 years. And it just so happens that the best mar equity market in the history of the world, which 
from 1982 to 1999. So if you think about that for a second, mm -hmm. everyone in the business today, they either, their experience came from working during the 80s and 90s, or they were trained by someone from that period. So that, that's what our uh, expectation is on how equity markets should perform. Yeah, you know, we get a crash in a couple of years and stuff, but in, in general, you know, you, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to make money, you just put it in the market and everyone made money. And then the other thing with that is that when you look at, as you mentioned, as you look at interest rates, you know, they really, they, you know, in, in the last number of years, if they peaked in 82 at around, you know, 18, 20%, 16, depending on which market you're looking at, you know, now it's faded around to zero percent. And, you know, I was, I was, you know, I was chatting with a uh, fixed income manager there a few weeks ago. He's an American guy. And uh, so we're talking about this, and he said, he said, Keith, I was managing fixed income in 1981. And he said, a broker called him up, institutional broker, institutional broker and said, you know, we have this corporate issue for you. It's coming out. It's 16% uh, yielding. You know, inflation, he said, is around 35 4% of the time. So, you know, there's around a 12% real yield on this bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said, nobody touched this thing with a 10-foot pole. Wow. So, if you compare that to today, you know, just compare it to trap. Today, fixed income managers are tripping up over themselves to buy negative yielding government debt. <laughs> it makes no sense. Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy. So as part of this whole chaos, you know, harmony, uh, I don't see it's chaotic at all in my mind. Well, this is, it's pretty easy to see where rates are going to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, investors really have to understand the difference, though, between uh, overnight rates, you know, that's what's controlled by the Fed, and Canada, and so forth, and then long-term rates, which is controlled by the market. So, um, you know, the, the interest rate environment, it, it's extremely toxic right now, and uh, there's little to no upside and, and considerable downside. So um, you really want to be careful in that asset class. Talking about debt, um, you know, in this negative interest rate environment, um, you know, there's several classifications of debt, but what is the most toxic or threatening to global growth in your mind? Because there's several um, categories. There's the sovereign debt, there's corporate debt, there's personal debt, such as auto real estate mortgages, installment loans. What What is the most toxic uh, in the near term here that will have a significant effect on on, on investing? Well, you know, the biggest macro effect is definitely the sovereign debt market. Okay. So, you know, bonds issued by governments, it's, it's going to be real messy. It's an extreme example. So right now in Japan, you know, roughly 20%, 22% of their tax revenues that come in goes towards paying interest on debt. And the average rate on their outstanding debt, um, let's, let's just say it's you know, a half percent. So if rates double to 1%, and then say they go up to 2%, and then 4 and 8 and so forth. Very quickly, you know, these governments, they run out of tax money coming in that they can use for other spending. Mm -hmm. so in, in other words, more and more of their tax revenues that they're collecting goes towards just paying interest on the debt. Central banks are independent, you know, from the treasuries and, and all that. Uh, I, I don't buy that at all. I can tell you, you know, the, the U.S. Treasury, they're calling the Fed and say, you've got to keep long-term rates low, overnight rates low, because, boy, we're, we're funding this deficit, and it's pretty darn cheap for us right now to, to finance that 0%. But the moment they start going up, all of a sudden, investors will step back and go, Hey, wow. So if you have a, like a typical bond strategy, say, uh, a, let's just keep things real simple. Like a long-term bond fund might have an average maturity of, say, 10 years. Okay, to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. if, if interest rates go up 1%, although those being equal, that bond fund will have a 10% loss. Mm -hmm. If they go up 2%, we can have a 20% loss. Hmm. And, and, and so forth. So it, it just becomes toxic. So for anyone buying these strategies today, you know, I, mean, I, I wish them luck. It's going to be real tough for them. But, but the worst thing that happens here is that as rates, as, as rates start to go up on the long end, it becomes more and more difficult for countries to, 
And only the funder deficit, the deficit is going to grow. It's way to go in our, you know, the economy, as I mentioned earlier, the global economy is grinding tighter, which means less economic growth, less, less tax revenue coming in. Uh, it, it's just creating this enormous wedge, you know, with, within the Treasury departments around the world. So it, it, it's going to be real tough for them to try to, um, you know, circle the way out of it. And, you know, price discovery will always happen eventually. And uh, in this case, what happened in the long end of the bond market. And, and there's a final point to leave you with. If you look back, you know, the Eurozone back in 2011 and 12, long-term rates in Italy very quickly went from 4, 6, 10, 12. You know, like within a couple of weeks. And it was at that point when Italy got shut out of funding markets. And, you know, that's when Draghi came, you know, with his famous speech. And he said, you know, he'll do whatever it takes to save everything. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I share that with you just so that people can understand how quickly the long and the bond market can go up. Mm-hmm. It, it's not a very gradual, you know, linear line. It, it just ratchets very quickly. And if you're in a bond strategy, then there's, there's no liquidity. It's not like the equity market, you know, there's a bit of ass going on, you know, you get that. Uh, the bond market is it, very different. And then, um, I guess the last uh, topic to talk talk uh, to kind of round out the economic uh, spectrum is, um, you know, you had a very interesting slide on capital flight to safety from from several countries, but one in particular, China. Uh, China. I mean, a lot of Chinese investors. What you saw in your uh, February two thousand sixteen outlook, um, of which in the amount of excess of one trillion dollars. Uh, in capital outflows. Now, is this the risk strategy to get their money out of a slowing China, or is it more just diversifying their their wealth? Yeah, well, wealthy people, you know, as um, as we know now, like they they avoid losses. So, you know, all this Chinese money coming to Vancouver to buy houses and, and everything. You know, Vancouver's lovely and you know it's a nice place, but you know, these Chinese investors they're not sitting down and saying, "Wow, we really want to invest in Vancouver." They're saying, "I want to get my money out of China." And then they say, where's a friendly place for it to go? You know, and Vancouver's getting a lot of it, you know, as would Seattle and you know, San Francisco and those places as well. And then, you know, you get from a Russian perspective, um, you know, the, the Russians are tripping over themselves to get the money out of Russia. You know, they're not bringing the money back in. Mm-hmm. And what's the main reason for, for, for both uh, those types of investors to get their money out? Well, you know, for the Chinese, I would imagine they're very concerned about currency devaluation, as well as government locking down whatever wealth they have. Mm-hmm. So that would that would be the main one. Same thing with Russians. You know, they're, they're right in the death of the ruble. Afraid what Putin might do with their accounts. You know, there's always a fear. Some of it is, you know, legitimate. Some of it isn't. But. People move the money. That, that's what foreign money moving around capital flows again. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that is the key one to look at. And, you know, like if you're in London, for example, you know, you, you're walking down, you know, to do one of the nice neighborhoods, brand new townhouses, buildings are gone up, They're completely sold out, and there's not one light on. Mm-hmm. But you ask the doorman, you know, is this an empty building? And they say, oh, no, people live here, but they never come. You know, they're all from the Middle East. So again, people want to park their money. They want to get it out of where there's trouble. And uh, you know, real estate's been a great, you know, easy mark than to do that. Mm-hmm. And are there any other countries that you've noticed where you've seen a huge increase in capital outflows in addition to China and Russia? I mean, it would have to, you know, it's always been happening in Latin America as well, of course, elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, to really understand what's happening, look, look within Europe. So, you know, one, one of the big things now is, you know, if you're in Italy, <clears throat> anyone listening to this from Italy, I mean, they're, I'm sure they're looking at their banks saying, i got to get my money out. And a, a lot of Europeans who look first in Switzerland or maybe look at Germany to move the money, um, I don't think that's quite the best move to make. You, know, you really want to go outside of the, the continent altogether. But money, money is moving around. That's, that's what happens, Sonny. And, you know, I can't give you like a specific country that, you know, you know be careful of Venezuela, and we, everyone knows that. But right, right. It's happening all over the place, and the US dollar will 
really search once one of these risks, everyone should know the risk. You know, it, once it happens, money just starts flowing. Mm -hmm. You know, Canada's a nice place, but you know, if, if you're a European and you're saying, well, I gotta, I gotta move my money, you know, Canadian dollar does not look on the radar. Right, right. So, 